Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to our fifth annual Silicon Valley Energy Summit. And I'd like to uh, thank everybody who's here. We're, as you notice, we're starting exactly on time, and the goal is to have the train running exactly on time as much as possible. Um, but we're try gonna try to keep it that way. Um, we, we will find that the room is gonna fill up more. Some people don't come at the uh, last moment. We, we believe that the number of registrants exceeds the number of spaces at these tables, so we're counting on, um, a, we have a little overbooking issue here, just like the airlines, and uh, we will, so be prepared to compress as, as additional people come in. What I'd like to do is start out is what I view as a sort of context for many elements of this conference, and, and that's, that's what energy efficiency has been for the U.S. economy. Many of us think about the impacts of solar and wind and other renewables, which are, which are um, the, the important new technologies. But today I'd like to spend the first 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, talking about energy efficiency. Um, and this is going to actually be drawn from from a book that we have the advanced copy of the book here. There's only a couple of these in existence, but any of you are interested in this, there's a little card on the table out there. Um, Hoover Press is publishing it, and they've been kind enough to offer, for our conference only, a 40% discount on on the book, including for the electronic format. So you can get the book normal price electronically for $7 and 40% off. So it's going to be a cheap book, and I don't want you to think it's, you're going to get, get what it pay with what it's worth. Uh, so let's talk about energy efficiency. Why do you care about energy efficiency? It's really uh, three things the economy, the environment, and security. And uh, in the beginning of the book, uh, Secretary Schultz, George Schultz, who's here, uh, who's, who's written, written the, uh, the foreword, asked three questions. He said, what's the, what's the, the cleanest um, form of energy you can use? Well, the energy you don't need at all. What's the most secure form of energy? The energy you don't use at all. And what's the cheapest form of energy? The energy you don't need at all. So it's a three-way play for the economy. Um, that's in the micro level and at the macro level, I want to convince you that this has been true for the United States as a whole. And if you look worldwide, which I'm not going to give data for, you see roughly these same patterns. But first, we recognize there's a lot of barriers to energy efficiency. There's a lot of reasons we don't get as much um, energy efficiency as, as we'd like to get. There's, there's uh, market failures, some institutional barriers, some behavioral issues. So there's good news and bad news about that. The bad news is we're not getting as much energy efficiency as we think we should be able to get. The good news is when we go overcome the barriers, we'll get more energy efficiency. So it means there's headroom left. But even with the, that's what we didn't get. What I want to talk about is what we did get. And I like to say it's the cup half full, except that's not right. It's the cup that you'll see is on 95% 90, full, not, not uh. so let's start by reminding us things that you all know but put it in context. First, we have an ongoing lighting revolution. Uh, first thing, we had the compact fluorescence, um, use about a quarter as much electricity as the, as the uh, incandescence. And you see I have a tie on here. I call this my obsolete uh, light bulbs tie. Has all lots of obsolete uh, uh, incandescence. But the fluorescent, compact fluorescence use about a quarter as much 
electricity, but they had problems. I mean, it's not the greatest quality of light. Until we came out with the LEDs. And you get a Cree LED or from other makers, beautiful quality light, dimmable, um, you, uses about a fifth as much electricity as, as the incandescent. And then, I don't know how many of you, how many of you have kids here? Yeah, not here, but have kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, well, some of you have kids here, but. Um, I used to tell my kids, you know, turn off the lights when you leave the room. Well, now we don't have to do that ourselves because we have equipment that turns them off for us in the light bulbs. In place of, if you look back at the old days where the whole building, or the whole floor of the building, commercial building was lit or none was lit, now lights, each office goes on and off and, and if you leave it and nobody has to yell at you to turn it off because they turn it off themselves. Uh, quantitatively, you can ask the significance of this for the various uses of, of light. And for the different things between uh, um, street lights and, and track lighting and light bulbs, we reduce the use of energy per unit of light by, by between 48% and 83%. Tremendously large change. Buildings. Well, just to flash on a few things in buildings. Buildings are now better insulated. California, we have Title 24 building codes. We have, have a continuously, uh, we have a continuously adjustable uh, pool pumps. Um, instead of just on and off, we have appliances that are Energy Star rated, and we have Energy Star certification of, of new homes that collectively, we all see that, we know that's going on. Um, commercial sets, we have um, at Stanford the biggest, they call it the Stanford Energy System Innovations. Doesn't generate any electricity whatsoever, it's an energy efficiency play for California where we, uh, for, for a district heating and cooling for the whole Stanford campus that uses a, electricity for heating and cooling and heat exchangers in, in the building, so we greatly reduce the use of energy. Um, up, up in the right is that the dashboard that internal to Microsoft that they use to monitor the building performances of all the buildings on their campus so they can find where there's the highest value for fixing things. We can have retrofits of buildings, and this is some data from the Empire State Building retrofit, which to me is a little surprising. We think about big building retrofit as not being economically attractive. That they expect to pay for itself, and it looks like they're really on track within five years to pay for all of the retrofits. You think about it as being the whole building, but actually two-thirds of, of their effect was, was in tenant spaces, which re required new contract structures and new shared performance agreements. So we have those throughout the economy, new uh, legal ways of operating. And then we have the spectacular success of the, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, um, look, if you build a high-tech building around here and it's only lead gold, you have to apologize a little bit. That is, <laughs> It's uh, anything that's not LEED certified now of the, of the you know, the new high-tech building, you know, it just doesn't happen. So we've seen that in the commercial space. In automobiles, if you look at this data, the horizontal vertical line is the energy crisis in 73. We see that um, in 1970, up to 73, the miles per gallon of automobiles was declining year after year of all cars on the road. 1973, the average car got 12 and a half miles per gallon. Um, we brought in cafe standards and we've in increased the efficiency roughly double so far with the new standards will roughly double again. And you can think about the difference. Here's a 73 Chevy Impala, 73. 2014 Chevy Impala, same interior room. The front and the back end are slightly different. 
Um, one's aerodynamic and the other's turbulent flow. One's big, the other's small. Big change. Air traffic. Um, we, if you, these are data for, for commercial and, um, and domestic airlines. The energy use per seat mile is down by a factor of two since the energy crisis in 1970. Down by a factor of two, and why is that? Well, the Boeing Dreamliner illustrates it. You, 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 see, the, you see the winglets at, at the... At the uh, bad timing. Okay, bad timing. Okay. Uh, my doctor's office saying you got a schedule for for a, a colonoscopy. <laughs> you know what? I don't think I've got to take that call now. <laughs> so the dream light, you see the the curved wings, the winglets, the better engines, the lighter materials. That's the two to one difference. But the fuel fuel use per Passenger mile is down by a factor of four. What's the other factor of four? Well, it's yield management. It's, it's, it's uh, dynamic pricing. It's, it's, it's stochastic forecasting. It's optimization procedures. It's operations. Totally behavioral systems analysis. Another factor of two. So factor of four, reduction in energy use per passenger mile. We have labeling um, on on now refrigerators and, and, and cars, Energy Star labeling that helps people understand what the energy cost is going to be. What this has all done is if you look at the, the cumulative data, the consumption trends in the four sectors of the economy, uh, from the top to the bottom, industrial, transportation, residential, and commercial. In 1973, with that vertical line, where we had the shot across the bow of the energy energy problem, the trends flattened. And you see that in each one of the sectors, those trends turned down. And the consequences of those have been tremendous for the US economy. You've all heard the advertisements that said, we've seen the new, the new energy power in the world. American Petroleum Institute brings us this. It said, oil and gas fracking for this, we, because of that, we have security in our nation in energy. We're not importing near, uh, much energy at all. Well, if you look at, at the data, if you look at that red line, that's what would have been the energy use if you had the existing trends of energy efficiency before the crisis. Half of a percent per year on the economy, you would have followed that red line. We actually followed the blue line. So the gray area is the energy reduction because of all of those turndowns that I've shown in the energy consumption um, uh, results. And so that, took 80 quads off the imports of the energy from what it would have been, 80 quadrillion BTUs. Um, on the supply side, we've had more nuclear power, and we're going to debate that at lunch, at lunch. We've had more renewables. Most of the more renewables was just direct combustion of wood and, and hydropower. Um, that yellow line is the effect of everything on the supply side, nuclear, wind, solar, geothermal, fracking for natural gas and additional oil production. So that's about 22 quads. So that's 100 between the 80 quads on the demand side and 22 quads on the supply side. That's why we now have energy security. We're, we're, we're soon to become a next net exporter of energy. So, I say, yeah, um, fracking for oil and gas mattered. You know, th that, th that in a glass of milk gives you a good, healthy breakfast. Uh, you know, it's, uh, if you remember that advertisement. Mostly energy efficiency. Um, carbon dioxide, the global climate change. We've decarbonized the economy since the oil crisis by 61%. That is the... Carbon dioxide per dollar of GDP, real adjusted for inflation, is down to 39% of what it was before, as illustrated by this graph. 
over time, where, where we start at one in 1973 and go down to 69, uh, 39% in 2013. So what caused that? The first was the pre-existing trends of, of changing energy intensity before the crisis. The green was the downturns. That was the rest of the energy intensity. So the green plus the blue is the energy intensity changes in the U.S. economy. So what about wind and solar and geothermal and nuclear power and fracking for natural gas? That's there. It's the thickness of that black line. It's the effect of all of those on decarbonizing the economy. Um, of that black line, 60% of it's nuclear power. 40% of it is wind plus solar plus geothermal plus flat fracking for natural gas. Uh, so yes, it's true that frack for, na for natural gas and wind and solar and renewables has helped decarbonize it, but not nearly as much as energy efficiency is. So this, that's the theme of the book that goes through at a lot of intensity. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to ask a question. Who and what? Why did this happen? Who did it? Well, uh, as an economist, I sometimes like nice, clean, one-line answers. There ain't none. There's no silver bullets. There's no silver buckshot. There's silver birdshot in here. Um, corporations, much more, if you look through this, most of the energy efficiency actually was what happened in the private sector. Energy efficient innovations, research and development, investments and operations, you see like in the airlines there, energy efficient products being offered for sale, buildings and vehicles becoming more energy efficient. But the government was setting at the same time regulation standards, labeling, information, tax credits, direct payments, R&D support. So that worked as a team together, the private sector and the government. NGOs were out there creating new regulatory models, non-governmental organizations, pressure on government, creating options for the private sector. Utilities were pro providing information, nudges, incentives for energy efficiency. And we have PG&E and, and Silicon Valley Power and Palo Alto Utilities, at least here, as well as some of the new uh, clean energy initiatives people are here. They've been all part of this. Research organizations and universities creating ideas, R&D, technologies and knowledge, and individuals' attitudes and awareness changes, purchasing. Now you pay attention to energy in a ways that we didn't before the oil crisis. Um, so when you try to separate this out, as I've done and I've tried to in the book, uh, in short, you can't, because they all work together where in, in a real sense, the whole was much greater than the sum of the parts. Each individual thing you look at, you say, that's not very significant. And the collection of it was great. It's sort of like a, a rainstorm in, in, in Dallas, in Texas right now, or Paris. You know, each raindrop didn't make any difference, but the total amount of it is a flood or a river. So in short, it's the type of people who are in this room. You probably all have been part of some element of this whole th system you've seen. And that's what I view as the context for a conference like this, is that we've had this remarkable amount of energy efficiency, giving us security for the economy, giving us good economic performance, giving us decarbonization of the economy, and we've met the heroes, and they are us. Now, I apologize to Pogo, because that's not exactly the way Pogo said it, but we, you get the idea that if you look around, we're all part of this action that has fundamentally transformed the, the use of energy in the US. This has happened more aggressively in the US than in other countries. but but. At a smaller scale, this has happened around the world. So the final thing, um, this is my shameful commercial um, um, 
argument. You can, you can get the, the, the card out on the table to get this book. This, isn't, this is a black and white version, just advanced copy, but um, um, you can pre-order it and come on August 1st. So let me end at that point because I'm out of time and uh, I want to introduce the really important hero here. I want to bring up um, the introducer to new uh, Secretary George Schultz. Okay, as you get settled, we've got a. Now my job is to make an introduction. But Jim, your remarks stimulate me to tell a couple of stories and make a point. <clears throat> I noticed in a little chart in your uh, book, it is by you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the inflection point is 1973. So let me make some points about that. In 1969, I'm Secretary of Labor and the president makes me chairman of a task force on the oil import program. President Eisenhower had thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we use, we were asking for trouble in national security terms. And we were beginning to bump up against that. That's why the task force. And we recommended what we thought were some blindingly obvious things. That is, the threat was not military, it was the turmoil in the Middle East involving the Israelis and the Arabs, and that could disrupt our supply of oil from there, so we should keep down our imports from that region. We said we ought to have some petroleum reserve as a little bit of an insurance policy. We said we should change the quota system to a tariff system so we get the rents rather than somebody else. We said there's no, we knew more about this subject than anybody else in the government. There should be somebody in the government paying attention. It's a strategic asset. And the report was published. The president thanked me, said nice report. There were congressional hearings. Nothing happened. Zero. 1973, I'm Secretary of the Treasury. That's your inflection point, Jim. And here comes the Arab boycott, oil boycott. More or less what we predicted. It wasn't hard to predict that. All hell breaks loose. A lot of electricity was produced from oil in those days. Christmas lights discouraged. Gas stations closed on weekends so you couldn't drive. Prices high. It made a big impact on people in their daily lives. And that's what caused things to change. It was big time impact. So where are we now? Well, there are a lot of analyses, and you can see certain things in the climate arena. But things are start, starting to happen that people notice. Our crab season is short in San Francisco. Hey, come on, how did that happen? Lucy Shapiro, brilliant biologist here at Stanford, says, tropical diseases are coming north, and we're not very much aware of it. So take a look at the news any day. Mosquitoes, Zika, what is it? This is beginning to affect people's lives in the way that they notice. So I think we're going to see a change as a result of that. It's the kind of thing that comes along with strategic analysis, but isn't the same thing. Okay, so that's my point. Now, my job here is to introduce the chairman of the uh, California Energy Commission, Robert Weissenmiller, who's sitting over here. We're lucky to have him here. Let me give uh, your credentials. If somebody's going to have that kind of an important post, we'd like the person to have a good education, right? So let's take a look at that. He got his bachelor degree, bachelor of science in chemistry from Providence College. Then he went to some place called Berkeley, University of California. <laughs> And he got a doctorate in chemistry and a master's in energy and resources. So the little box labeled education put a check mark on it. <laughs> then it would be nice if somebody who's doing things in the government 
has messed around in the private sector a little bit, so he sees a little bit of what that's all about, and he has. He's been part of a couple of companies, the co-founder, so he has a little entrepreneurial spirit in him. That's good. So we have that, so check off that box. Then he's not only now the chair of the California Energy Commission, he was first appointed by Governor Brown way back in 2011, and then reappointed. So he's had government experience. He had a little government experience before that, too. So check off that box. So we have a man who's eminently qualified to be the chairman of the California Energy Commission, so we're lucky as a state to have him in that post, and we're really lucky to have him as our opening speaker. I'm not, you are our opening speaker, Jim, excuse me. Um, <laughs> as our opening speaker from the outside, Robert Weissenmiller. <laughs> 